This is taken from my weekly podcast called Down to Sleep, where I softly read books to you to help you get a good night's rest. Before I tuck you in, please hit that like button, as it helps me know that you enjoy these videos. If you'd like to hear more, all the links that you need are in the description. Enjoy. The Wonderful Wizard of Oz Chapter 8 The Deadly Poppy Field Our little party of travellers awakened the next morning refreshed and full of hope, and Dorothy breakfasted like a princess, off peaches and plums from the trees beside the river. Behind them was a dark forest that they had passed safely through, although they had suffered many discouragements, but before them was a lovely, sunny country that seemed to beckon them on to the Emerald City. To be sure, the broad river now cut them off from this beautiful land, but the raft was nearly done, and after the tin woodman had cut a few more logs and fastened them together with wooden pins, they were ready to start. Dorothy sat down in the middle of the raft and held Toto in her arms. When the cowardly lion stepped upon the raft, it tipped badly, for he was big and heavy. But the scarecrow and the tin woodman stood upon the other ends to steady it, and they had long poles in their hands to push the raft through the water. They got along quite well at first, but when they reached the middle of the river, the swift current swept the raft downstream, farther and farther away from the road of yellow brick and the water grew so deep that the long poles would not touch the bottom. "'This is bad,' said the tin woodman, "'for if we cannot get to the land we shall be carried into the country of the wicked witch of the west, and she will enchant us and make us her slaves.' "'Then I should get no brains,' said the scarecrow. "'And I should get no courage,' said the cowardly lion. "'And I should get no heart,' said the tin woodman. "'And I would never get back to Kansas,' said Dorothy." We must certainly get to the Emerald City if we can, the Scarecrow continued, and he pushed so hard on his long pole that it stuck fast in the mud at the bottom of the river. Then, before he could pull it out again or let go, the raft was swept away, and the poor Scarecrow was left clinging to the pole in the middle of the river. Goodbye, he called after them, and they were very sorry to leave him. Indeed, the Tin Woodman began to cry, but fortunately remembered that he might rust, so dried his tears on Dorothy's apron. Of course, this was a bad thing for the Scarecrow. I'm now worse off than when I first met Dorothy, he thought. Then I was stuck on a pole in a cornfield, where I could make believe scare the crows at any rate. Surely there's no use for a Scarecrow stuck on a pole in the middle of a river. I'm afraid I shall never have any brains after all. Down the stream the raft floated and the poor Scarecrow was left far behind. Then the lion said, Something must be done to save us. I think I can swim to the shore and pull the raft after me, if you will only hold fast to the tip of my tail. So he sprang into the water, and the tin woodman caught fast hold of his tail. Then the lion began to swim with all his might towards the shore. It was hard work, although he was so big, but by and by they were drawn out of the current. Then Dorothy took the tin woodman's long pole and helped push the raft to the land. They were all tired out when they reached the shore at last and stepped off upon the pretty green grass and they also knew that the stream had carried them a long way past the yellow brick road that led to Emerald City. "'What shall we do now?' asked the tin woodman, as the lion lay down on the grass to let the sun dry him. "'We must get back to the road in some way,' said Dorothy. "'The best plan will be to walk along the river bank until we come to the road again,' remarked the lion. So, when they were rested, Dorothy picked up her basket, and they started along the grassy bank." to the road from which the river had carried them. It was a lovely country, with plenty of flowers and fruit trees and sunshine to cheer them, and had they not felt so sorry for the poor scarecrow, they could have been very happy. They walked along as fast as they could, Dorothy only stopping once to pick a beautiful flower, and after a time the tin woodman cried out, Look! They all looked at the river, and saw the scarecrow perched upon his pole in the middle of the water, looking very lonely and sad. "'What can we do to save him?' asked Dorothy. The lion and the woodman both shook their heads, for they did not know. So they sat down upon the bank and gazed wistfully at the scarecrow, until a stork flew by, who, upon seeing them, stopped to rest at the water's edge. "'Who are you and where are you going?' asked the stork. "'I'm Dorothy,' answered the girl. These are my friends, the Tin Woodman and the Cowardly Lion, and we're going to Emerald City. 
This isn't the road, said the stork as she twisted her long neck and looked sharply at the queer party. I know it, returned Dorothy. We've lost the scarecrow and we're wondering how we'll get him again. Where is he? asked the stork. Over there in the river, answered the little girl. If he wasn't so big and heavy, I would get him for you, remarked the stork. He isn't heavy a bit, said Dorothy, for he is stuffed with straw and if you will bring him back to us, we shall thank you ever and ever so much. Well, I'll try, said the stork. But if I find he's too heavy to carry, I'll have to drop him in the river again. So the big bird flew into the air and over the water until she came to where the scarecrow was perched upon his pole. Then the stork, with her great claws, grabbed the scarecrow by the arm and carried him up into the air and back to the bank, where Dorothy and the lion and the tin woodman and Toto were sitting. When the scarecrow found himself among his friends again, he was so happy that he hugged them all, even the lion and Toto. And as they walked along, he sang at every step. He felt so gay. I was afraid I should have to stay in the river forever, he said, but the kind stork saved me, and if I ever get any brains, I shall find the stork again and do her some kindness in return. That's all right, said the stork, who was flying along besides them. I always like to help anyone in trouble, but I must go now, for my babies are waiting in the nest for me. I hope you'll find the Emerald City and that Oz will help you. Thank you, replied Dorothy, and then the kind stork flew into the air and was soon out of sight. They walked along listening to the singing of the brightly coloured birds, looking at the lovely flowers which now became so thick that the ground was carpeted with them. There were big yellow, white and blue and purple blossoms, besides great clusters of scarlet poppies, which were so brilliant in colour that they almost dazzled Dorothy's eyes. Aren't they beautiful? the girl asked, as she breathed in the spicy scent of the bright flowers. I suppose so, answered the scarecrow. When I have brains, I'll probably like them better. If only I had a heart, I should love them, said the tin woodman. I always did like flowers, said the lion. They seem so helpless and frail, but there are none in the forest so bright as these. They now came upon more and more of the big scarlet poppies and fewer and fewer of the other flowers, and soon they found themselves in the midst of a great meadow of poppies. Now it is well known that when there are many of these flowers together, their odour is so powerful that anyone who breathes it falls asleep. And if the sleeper is not carried away from the scent of the flowers, he sleeps on and on forever. But Dorothy did not know this, nor could she get away from the bright red flowers that were everywhere about. So presently her eyes grew heavy, and she felt she must sit down to rest and to sleep. But the tin woodman would not let her do this. We must hurry and get back to the road of yellow brick before dark, he said. The scarecrow agreed. So they kept walking until Dorothy could stand no longer. Her eyes closed in spite of herself and she forgot where she was and she fell among the poppies. Fast asleep. What shall we do? asked the tin woodman. If we leave her here, she'll die, said the lion. The smell of the flowers is killing us all. I myself can scarcely keep my eyes open, and if the dog is asleep already... It was true. Toto had fallen down besides his little mistress. But the scarecrow and the tin woodman, not being made of flesh, were not troubled by the scent of the flowers. Run fast, said the scarecrow to the lion. Get out of this deadly flower bed as soon as you can. We will bring the little girl with us, but if you should fall asleep, you are too big to be carried. So the lion aroused himself and bounded forwards as fast as he could go. In a moment he was out of sight. Let us make a chair with our hands and carry her, said the scarecrow. So they picked up Toto and they put the dog in Dorothy's lap. And then they made a chair with their hands for the seat, their arms for the arms, and they carried the sleeping girl between them through the flowers. On and on they walked, and it seemed that the great carpet of deadly flowers that surrounded them would never end. They followed the bend of the river and at last came upon their friend, the lion, lying fast asleep among the poppies. The flowers had been too strong for the huge beast, and he had given up at last, and fallen only a short distance from the end of the poppy bed where the sweet grass spread in beautiful green fields before them. We can do nothing for him, said the tin woodman sadly, for he is much too heavy to lift. We must leave him here to sleep on forever, and perhaps he will dream that he has found courage at last. I'm sorry, said the scarecrow. 
The lion was a very good comrade for one so cowardly. But let us go on. They carried the sleeping girl to a pretty spot beside the river, far enough from the poppy field to prevent her breathing any more of the poison of the flowers. And here they laid her gently on the soft grass and waited for the fresh breeze to wake her. The Queen of the Field Mice We cannot be far from the road of yellow brick now, remarked the scarecrow as he stood beside the girl, for we've nearly come as far as the river carried us away. The Tin Woodman was about to reply when he heard a low growl, and turning his head, which worked beautifully on hinges, he saw a strange beast come bounding over the grass towards them. It was indeed a great yellow wildcat, and the Woodman thought it must be chasing something, for its ears were lying close to its head, and its mouth was wide open, showing two rows of ugly teeth, while its red eyes glowed like balls of fire. As it came nearer, the Tin Woodman saw that running before the beast was a little gay field mouse, and although he had no heart, he knew it was wrong for the wild cat to try and kill such a pretty and harmless creature. So the Woodman raised his axe, and as the wild cat ran by, he gave it a quick blow that cut the beast's head clean off from its body, and it rolled over at his feet in two pieces. The field mouse, now that it was freed from its enemy, stopped short and coming slowly up to the woodman, it said in a squeaky little voice, Oh, thank you. Thank you ever so much for saving my life. Don't speak of it, I beg you, replied the woodman. I have no heart, you know, so I'm careful to help all of those who may need a friend, even if it happens to be only a mouse. Only a mouse, cried the little animal indignantly. Why, I am a queen, the queen of all the field mice. Oh, Indeed, said the woodman, making a bow. Therefore you have done a great deed, as well as a brave one in saving my life, added the queen. At that moment several mice were seen running up as fast as their little legs could carry them, and when they saw their queen they exclaimed, Oh, your majesty, we thought you would be killed. How did you manage to escape the great wildcat? They all bowed so low to the little queen that they almost stood upon their heads. This funny tin man, she answered, killed the wild cat and saved my life. So hereafter you must all serve him and obey his slightest wish. We will, cried the mice in a shrill chorus, and then they scampered in all directions, for Toto had awakened from his sleep. And seeing all these mice around him, he gave one bark of delight and jumped right into the middle of the group. Toto had always loved to chase mice when he lived in Kansas, and he saw no harm in it. But the tin woodman caught the dog in his arms and held him tight, while he called to the mice, "'Come back. Toto shall not hurt you.' At this the queen of the mice stuck her head out from underneath a clump of grass and asked in a timid voice, "'Are you sure he will not bite us?' "'I will not let him,' said the woodman, "'so do not be afraid.' One by one the mice came creeping back, and Toto did not bark again, although he tried to get out of the woodman's arms and would have bitten him had he not known very well that he was made of tin." Finally, one of the biggest mice spoke. "'Is there anything we can do?' it asked. "'To repay you for saving the life of our queen?' "'Nothing that I know of,' answered the woodman. But the scarecrow, who had been trying to think, but could not because his head was stuffed with straw, said, "'Oh, yes, you can save our friend, the cowardly lion, who's asleep in the poppy bed.' "'A lion?' cried the little queen. "'Why, he would eat us all up.' Oh, no, declared the scarecrow. This lion is a coward. Really? asked the mouse. He says so himself, answered the scarecrow, and he would never hurt anyone who is our friend. If you will help us to save him, I promise he shall treat you all with kindness. Very well, said the queen. We trust you, but what shall we do? Are there many of these mice which call you queen and are willing to obey you? Oh, yes, thousands, she replied. Then send for them all to come here as soon as possible and let each one bring a long piece of string. The queen turned to the mice that attended her and told them to go at once and get all of her people. As soon as they heard her orders, they ran away in every direction as fast as possible. Now, said the scarecrow to the tin woodman, you must go to those trees by the riverside and make a truck that will carry the lion. So the woodman went at once to the trees and began to work and he soon made a truck out of the limbs of the trees for which he chopped away all the leaves and branches he fastened it together with wooden pegs and made the four wheels out of short pieces of a big tree trunk. So fast and so well did he work that by the time the mice began to arrive, the truck was all ready for them. They came from all directions, and there were thousands of them, 
big mice and little mice and middle-sized mice, and each one brought a piece of string in his mouth. It was about this time when Dorothy woke up from her long sleep and opened her eyes. She was greatly astonished to find herself lying upon the grass, with thousands of mice standing around and looking at her timidly. But the scarecrow told her about everything, and turning to the dignified little mouse, he said, "'Permit me to introduce to you Her Majesty, the Queen.' Dorothy nodded gravely, and the Queen made a curtsy, after which she became quite friendly with the little girl. The Scarecrow and the Woodman now began to fasten the mice to the truck, using the strings that they had brought. One end of a string was tied around the neck of each mouse, and the other end to the truck. Of course, the truck was a thousand times bigger than any of the mice who were to draw it, but when all of the mice had been harnessed, they were able to pull it quite easily. Even the Scarecrow and the Tin Woodman could sit on it, and were drawn swiftly by their queer little horses to the place where the lion lay asleep. After a great deal of hard work, for the lion was heavy, they managed to get him up on the truck, and then the Queen hurriedly gave her people the order to start, for she feared if the mice stayed among the poppies too long that they also would fall asleep. At first the little creatures, many though they were, could hardly stir the heavily loaded truck, but the woodman and the scarecrow both pushed from behind, and they got along better. Soon they rolled the lion out of the poppy bed to the green fields, where he could breathe the sweet, fresh air again instead of poisonous scent of the flowers. Dorothy came to meet them and thanked the little mice warmly for saving her companion from death. She had grown so fond of the big lion, and she was glad that he had been rescued. Then the mice were unharnessed from the truck, and they scampered away through the grass to their homes. The queen of the mice was the last to leave. "'If you ever need us again,' she said, "'come out into the field and call. "'We shall hear you and come to your assistance. "'Goodbye.' "'Goodbye,' they all answered, and away the queen ran, "'while Dorothy held Toto tightly "'lest he should run after her and frighten her. "'After this they sat down beside the lion "'until he should awaken, "'and the scarecrow brought Dorothy some fruit from a tree nearby, "'which she ate for dinner.' The Guardian of the Gate It was some time before the cowardly lion awakened, for he had lain among the poppies a long while, breathing in their deadly fragrance. But when he did open his eyes and roll off the truck, he was very glad to find himself still alive. I ran as fast as I could, he said, sitting down and yawning. But the flowers were too strong for me. How did you get me out? Then they told him of the field mice and how they had generously saved him from death, and the cowardly lion laughed and said, I've always thought myself very big and terrible, yet such little things as flowers came near to killing me, and such small animals as mice have saved my life. How strange it all is. What shall we do now? We must journey on until we find the road of yellow brick again, said Dorothy, and then we can keep on for Emerald City. So, the lion being fully refreshed and feeling quite himself again, they started upon the journey, greatly enjoying the walk through the soft, fresh grass, and it was not long before they reached the road of yellow brick, and turned again towards the Emerald City, where the great Oz dwelt. The road was smooth and well paved now, and the country about was beautiful, so the travellers rejoiced in leaving the forest far behind and with it the many dangers that they had met in its gloomy shades. Once more they could see fences built beside the road, but these were painted green, and when they came to a small house in which a farmer evidently lived, that also was painted green, they passed by several of these houses during the afternoon, and sometimes people came to the doors and looked at them as if they would like to ask questions. But no one came near them or spoke to them because of the great lion, of which they were very afraid. The people were all dressed in clothing of a lovely emerald green colour, and wore peaked hats like those of the munchkins. "'Well, this must be the land of Oz,' said Dorothy. "'And we are surely getting near the Emerald City.' "'Yes,' answered the Scarecrow. "'Everything is green here, while in the country of the munchkins blue was the favourite colour. But the people do not seem to be as friendly as the munchkins, and I'm afraid we shall be unable to find a place to pass the night.' "'I should like to eat something besides fruit,' said the girl.' I am sure Toto is nearly starved. Let us stop at the next house and talk to the people. So when they came to a good-sized farmhouse, Dorothy walked boldly up to the door and knocked. 
A woman opened it just far enough to look out and said, What do you want, child? And why is that great lion with you? We wish to pass the night with you if you will allow us, answered Dorothy. And the lion is my friend and comrade and would not hurt you for the world. Is he tame? asked the woman, opening the door a little wider. Oh, yes, said the girl, and he's a great coward, too. He will be more afraid of you than you are of him. Well, said the woman, after thinking it over and taking another peep at the lion, if that is the case, then you may come in, and I will give you some supper and a place to sleep. So they all entered the house, where there were besides the woman two children and a man. The man had hurt his leg and was lying on the couch in a corner. They seemed greatly surprised to see so strange a company, and while the woman was busy laying the table, the man asked, "'Where are you all going?' "'To the Emerald City,' said Dorothy, "'to see the great Oz.' "'Oh, indeed!' exclaimed the man. "'Are you sure that Oz will see you?' "'Why not?' she replied. "'Why, it's said that he never lets anyone come into his presence. "'I've been to the Emerald City many times, "'and it's a beautiful and wonderful place, "'but I've never been permitted to see the great Oz, "'nor do I know of any living person who has seen him.' "'Does he never go out?' asked the Scarecrow. "'Never. He sits day after day in the great throne room of his palace, "'and even those who wait upon him do not see him face to face.' "'What is he like?' asked the girl. "'That is hard to tell,' said the man thoughtfully. "'You see, Oz is a great wizard and can take on any form he wishes. "'Some say he looks like a bird. "'Some say he looks like an elephant. "'Some say he looks like a cat. To others he appears as a beautiful fairy or a brownie, or in any other form that pleases him. But who the real Oz is when he's in his own form, no living person can tell. That is very strange, said Dorothy. But we must try, in some way, to see him, or we shall have made our journey for nothing. Why do you wish to see the terrible Oz? asked the man. I, I want him to give me some brains, said the Scarecrow eagerly. Oh, Oz could do that easily enough, declared the man. He's more brains than he needs. I want him to give me a heart, said the Tin Woodman. Well, that will not trouble him. For Oz has a large collection of hearts of all sizes and shapes. Well, I want him to give me courage, said the Cowardly Lion. Oz keeps a great pot of courage in his throne room, said the man, which he has covered with a gold plate to keep it from running over. He'll be glad to give you some. I want him to send me back to Kansas, said Dorothy. Where's Kansas? asked the man with surprise. I don't know, replied Dorothy sorrowfully, but it is my home, and I'm sure it's somewhere. Very likely. Well, Oz can do anything, so I suppose he'll find Kansas for you. But first you must get to see him, and that will be a hard task, for the great wizard does not like to see anyone. He usually has his own way. What do you want? He continued, speaking to Toto. Toto only wagged his tail, for, strange to say... He could not speak. The woman called them to supper, so they gathered around the table and Dorothy ate some delicious porridge and a dish of scrambled eggs and a plate of nice white bread and enjoyed her meal. The lion ate some of the porridge but did not care for it, saying it was made from oats and oats were food for horses, not for lions. The scarecrow and the tin woodman ate nothing at all. Toto ate a little bit of everything and was glad to get a good supper again. The woman now gave Dorothy a bed to sleep in, and Toto lay down beside her, while the lion guarded the door of the room so she might not be disturbed. The scarecrow and the tin woodman stood up in a corner and kept quiet all night, because of course they could not sleep. The next morning, as soon as the sun was up, they started on their way, and soon saw a beautiful green glow in the sky just before them. "'That must be Emerald City,' said Dorothy. As they walked on, the green glow became brighter and brighter, and it seemed that at last they were nearing the end of their travels. Yet it was afternoon before they came to the great wall that surrounded the city. It was high and thick and of a bright green color. In front of them and at the end of the yellow brick was a big gate, all studded with emeralds that glittered so in the sun that even the painted eyes of the scarecrow were dazzled by their brilliancy. There was a bell besides the gate, and Dorothy pushed the button and heard a silvery tinkle sound within. Then the big gate swung slowly open, and they all passed through and found themselves in a high arched room, the walls of which glistened with countless emeralds. 
Before them stood a little man about the same size as the munchkins. He was clothed all in green, from his head to his feet, and even his skin was a greenish tint. At his side was a large green box. When he saw Dorothy and her companions, the man asked, "'What do you wish for in Emerald City?' "'We came here to see the Great Oz,' said Dorothy. The man was so surprised at this answer that he sat down to think it over. "'It's been many years since anyone asked me to see Oz,' he said, shaking his head in perplexity. "'He is powerful and terrible, and if you come on an idle or foolish errand to bother the wise reflections of the Great Wizard, he might be angry and destroy you all in an instant.' "'But it is not a foolish errand nor an idle one,' replied the Scarecrow. "'It is important, and we have been told that Oz is a good wizard.' "'So he is,' said the Green Man, "'and he rules the Emerald City wisely and well. "'But to those who are not honest or who approach him from curiosity, he is most terrible, "'and few have ever dared to ask to see his face. "'I am the guardian of the gates, "'and since you demand to see the great Oz, I must take you to his palace.' "'But first you must put on the spectacles.' "'Why?' asked Dorothy. "'Because if you did not wear spectacles, "'the brightness and the glory of the Emerald City would blind you. "'Even those who live in the city must wear spectacles, night and day. "'They are all locked on, for Oz so ordered it when the city was first built, "'and I have the only key that will unlock them.' "'He opened the big box, and Dorothy saw that it was filled with spectacles, "'of every size and shape.' All of them had green glass in them. The guardian of the gates found a pair that would fit Dorothy and put them over her eyes. There were two golden bands fastened to them that passed around the back of her head, where they were locked together, by a little key that was at the end of a chain that the guardian of the gates wore around his neck. When they were on, Dorothy could not take them off had she wished. But of course she did not wish to be blinded by the glare of the Emerald City, so she said nothing. Then the green man fitted spectacles for the scarecrow, and the tin woodman, and the lion, and even on little Toto, when all were locked fast with the key. Then the guardian of the gates put on his own glasses, and told them that he was ready to show them to the palace. Taking a big golden key from a peg on the wall, he opened another gate, and they all followed him through the portal into the streets of the Emerald City. And the Wonderful Wizard of Oz, Chapter 11, The Wonderful City of Oz. Even with eyes protected by the green spectacles, Dorothy and her friends were at first dazzled by the brilliancy of the wonderful city. The streets were lined with beautiful houses, all built of green and marble and studded everywhere with sparkling emeralds. They walked over a pavement of the same green marble, and where the blocks were joined together with rows of emeralds set closely and glittering in the brightness of the sun. The window panes were of green glass, even the sky above the city had a green tint, and the rays of the sun were green. There were many people, men, women, children, walking about, and these were all dressed in green clothes, and had greenish skins. They looked at Dorothy and her strangely assorted company with wondering eyes and the children all ran away and hid behind their mothers when they saw the lion. But no one spoke to them. Many shops stood in the street, and Dorothy saw that everything in them was green. Green candy and green popcorn were offered for sale, as well as green shoes, green hats, and green clothes of all sorts. At one place, a man was selling green lemonade, and when the children bought it, Dorothy could see that they paid for it with green pennies. There seemed to be no horses nor animals of any kind. The men carried things around in little green carts, which they pushed before them. Everyone seemed happy and contented and prosperous. The guardian of the gates led them through the streets until they came to a big building, exactly in the middle of the city, which was the palace of Oz the Great Wizard. There was a soldier before the door, dressed in a green uniform and wearing a long green beard. "'Here are strangers,' said the guardian of the gates to him, "'and they demand to see the great Oz. "'Step inside,' answered the soldier, "'and I will carry your message to him.' "'So they passed through the palace gates "'and were led into a big room with a green carpet "'and lovely green furniture set with emeralds. "'The soldier made them all wipe their feet "'upon a green mat before entering this room, "'and when they were seated, he said politely, 
Please make yourselves comfortable while I go to the door of the throne room and tell Oz you are here. They had to wait a long time before the soldier returned. When at last he came back, Dorothy asked, Have you seen Oz? Oh no, returned the soldier. I have never seen him. But I spoke to him as he sat behind his screen and gave him your message. He said he will grant you an audience if you so desire, but each one of you must enter his presence alone, and he will admit but one each day. Therefore, as you must remain in the palace for several days, I will have shown you to your rooms, where you may rest in comfort after your journey. Thank you, replied the girl. That is very kind of Oz. The soldier now blew upon a green whistle, and at once a young girl dressed in a pretty green silk gown entered the room. She had lovely green hair and green eyes, and she bowed low before Dorothy as she said, Follow me, and I will show you your room. So Dorothy said goodbye to all her friends except Toto, and taking the dog in her arms, followed the green girl through seven passages and up three flights of stairs, until they came to a room at the front of the palace. It was the sweetest little room in the world, with a soft, comfortable bed that had sheets of green silk and a green velvet counterpane. There was a tiny fountain in the middle of the room that shot a spray of green perfume into the air to fall back into a beautifully carved green marble basin. Beautiful green flowers stood in the windows and there was a shelf with a row of little green books. When Dorothy had time to open these books, she found them full of queer green pictures that made her laugh. They were so funny. In a wardrobe were many green dresses made of silk and satin and velvet, and all of them fitted Dorothy exactly. Make yourself perfectly at home, said the green girl, and if you wish for anything, ring the bell. Oz will send for you tomorrow morning. These she also led to rooms, and each one of them found himself lodged in a very pleasant part of the palace. Of course this politeness was wasted on the scarecrow, for when he found himself alone in his room, he stood stupidly in one spot, just within the doorway, to wait till morning. It would not rest him to lie down, and he could not close his eyes, so he remained, all night staring at a little spider which was weaving its web in a corner of the room, just as if it were not one of the most wonderful rooms in the world. The Tin Woodman lay down on his bed from force of habit, for he remembered when he was made of flesh, but not being able to sleep. He passed the night moving his joints up and down to make sure they were kept in good working order. The lion would have preferred a bed of dried leaves in the forest and did not like being shut up in a room, but he had too much sense to let this worry him. So he sprang upon the bed and rolled himself up like a cat and purred himself to sleep in a minute. The next morning, after breakfast, the green maiden came to fetch Dorothy and she dressed her in one of the prettiest gowns made of green satin. Dorothy put on a green silk apron and tied a green ribbon around Toto's neck, and they started for the throne room of the great Oz. First, they came to a great hall, in which were many ladies and gentlemen of the court, all dressed in rich costumes. These people had nothing to do but talk to each other, but they always came to wait outside the throne room every morning, although they were never permitted to see Oz. As Dorothy entered, they looked at her curiously, and one of them whispered, Are you really going to look upon the face of Oz the Terrible? Of course, answered the girl, if he will see me. Oh, he will see you, said the soldier who had taken the message to the wizard, although he does not like to have people ask to see him. Indeed, at first he was angry and said I should send you back where you came from. Then he asked me what you look like, and when I mentioned your silver shoes, he was very much interested. At last I told him about the mark upon your forehead, and he decided he would admit you to his presence. Just then a bell rang, and the green girl said to Dorothy, That is the signal. You must go into the throne room alone. She opened a little door, and Dorothy walked boldly through, and found herself in a wonderful place. It was a big round room, with a high arched roof, and the walls and ceiling and floor were covered with large emeralds set closely together. In the centre of the roof was a great light as bright as the sun, which made the emeralds sparkle in a wonderful manner. But what interested Dorothy most was the big throne of green marble that stood in the middle of the room. It was shaped like a chair and sparkled with gems, as did everything else. In the centre of the chair was an enormous head, 
without a body to support it or any arms or legs whatever. There was no hair upon this head, but it had eyes and a nose and mouth and was much bigger than the head of the biggest giant. As Dorothy gazed upon this in wonder and fear, the eyes turned slowly and looked at her sharply and steadily. Then the mouth moved, and Dorothy heard a voice say, I am Oz, the great and terrible. Who are you, and why do you seek me? It was not such an awful voice as she had expected from this big head, so she took courage and answered, I am Dorothy, small and meek. I've come to you for help. The eyes looked at her thoughtfully for a full minute. Then said the voice, Where did you get the silver shoes? I got them from the Wicked Witch of the East when my house fell on her and killed her, she replied. Where did you get the mark upon your forehead? continued the voice. That is where the good witch of the north kissed me when she bade me goodbye and sent me to you, said the girl. Again the eyes looked at her sharply, and they saw she was telling the truth. Then Oz asked, What do you wish me to do? Send me back to Kansas, where my Aunt Em and Uncle Henry are, she answered earnestly. I don't like your country, although it is so beautiful, and I'm sure Aunt Em will be dreadfully worried over my being away so long. The eyes winked three times and they turned up to the ceiling and down to the floor, and rolled around so queerly that they seemed to see every part of the room. And at last, they looked at Dorothy again. Why should I do this for you? asked Oz. Because you are strong, and I am weak. Because you are a great wizard, and I am only a little girl. But you were strong enough to kill the Wicked Witch of the East, said Oz. That just happened, returned Dorothy simply. I could not help it. Well, said the head, I will give you my answer. You have no right to expect me to send you back to Kansas unless you do something for me in return. In this country, everyone must pay for everything he gets. If you wish me to use my magic power to send you home again, you must do something for me first. Help me, and I will help you. What must I do? asked the girl. Kill the Wicked Witch of the West answered Oz. But I cannot, exclaimed Dorothy, greatly surprised. You killed the Wicked Witch of the East, and you wear the silver shoes which bear a powerful charm. There is now but one Wicked Witch left in all this land, and when you can tell me she is dead, I will send you back to Kansas, but not before. The little girl began to weep. She was so much disappointed, and the eyes winked again and looked upon her anxiously, as if the great Oz felt that she could help him if she would. I never killed anything willingly, she sobbed. Even if I wanted to, how could I kill the Wicked Witch? If you are who are great and terrible, cannot kill her yourself, how do you expect me to do it? I do not know, said the head, but that is my answer. And until the Wicked Witch dies, you will not see your uncle and aunt again. Remember that the witch is wicked, tremendously wicked, and ought to be killed. Now go. Do not ask to see me again until you have done your task. Sorrowfully, Dorothy left the throne room and went back where the lion and scarecrow and tin woodman were waiting to hear what Oz had said to her. There is no hope for me, she said sadly, for Oz will not send me home until I have killed the wicked witch of the West, and that I can never do. Her friends were sorry but could do nothing to help her, so Dorothy went to her own room and lay down on the bed and cried herself to sleep. The next morning the soldier with the green whiskers came to the scarecrow and said, Come with me, Oz has sent for you. So the scarecrow followed him, and was admitted into the great throne room, where he saw sitting in the emerald throne a most lovely lady. She was dressed in green silk gauze and wore upon her flowing green locks a crown of jewels. Growing from her shoulders were wings gorgeous in colour and so light that they fluttered if the slightest breath of air reached them. When the scarecrow had bowed as prettily as his straw stuffing would let him before this beautiful creature, she looked upon him sweetly and said, I am Oz, the great and terrible. Who are you, and why do you seek me? Now the scarecrow, who had expected to see the great head that Dorothy had told him of, was much astonished, but he answered her bravely, I am only a scarecrow, stuffed with straw. 
Therefore I have no brains, and I come to you, praying that you'll put brains in my head instead of straw, so that I may become as much a man as any other in your dominion. Why should I do this for you? asked the lady. Because you're wise and powerful, and no one else can help me, answered the scarecrow. I never grant favors without some return, said Oz, but this much I will promise. If you will kill for me the Wicked Witch of the West, I will bestow upon you a great many brains, and such good brains that you will be the wisest man in all the land of Oz. I thought you asked Dorothy to kill the witch, said the Scarecrow in surprise. So I did. I don't care who kills her, but until she is dead, I will not grant your wish. Now go, and do not seek me again until you have earned the brains that you so greatly desire. The Scarecrow went sorrowfully back to his friends and told them what Oz had said. Dorothy was surprised to find that the great wizard was not a head as she had seen him, but a lovely lady. All the same, said the Scarecrow, she needs a heart as much as the Tin Woodman. On the next morning, the soldier with the green whiskers came to the Tin Woodman and said, Oz has sent for you. Follow me. So the Tin Woodman followed him and came to the great throne room. He did not know whether he would find Oz, a lovely lady, or a head, but he hoped it would be the lovely lady. For, he said to himself, if it's their head, I'm sure I will not be given a heart, since a head has no heart of its own, and therefore cannot feel for me. But if it's a lovely lady, I shall beg hard for a heart, for all ladies are themselves said to be kindly hearted. But when the woodman entered the great throne room, he saw neither the head nor the lady, for Oz had taken the shape of a most terrible beast. It was nearly as big as an elephant, and the green throne seemed hardly strong enough to hold its weight. The beast had a head like that of a rhinoceros, only there were five eyes in its face, five long arms growing out of its body, and five long slim legs. Thick woolly hair covered every part of it, and a more dreadful-looking monster could not be imagined. It was fortunate that the Tin Woodman had no heart at the moment, for it would have beat loud and fast from terror. But being only tin, the woodman was not at all afraid, although he was much disappointed. I am Oz the Great and Terrible, spoke the beast in a voice that was one great roar. Who are you and why do you seek me? I'm a woodman, made of tin. Therefore I have no heart and cannot love. I pray you to give me a heart that I may be as other men are. Why should I do this? demanded the beast. "'Because I ask for it, and you alone can grant my request,' answered the woodman. Oz gave a low growl at this, but said gruffly, "'If you indeed desire a heart, you must earn it.' "'How?' asked the woodman. "'Help Dorothy kill the wicked witch of the West,' replied the beast. "'When the witch is dead, come to me, and I will then give you the biggest and kindest and most loving heart in all the land of Oz.' So the Tin Woodman was forced to return sorrowfully to his friends and tell them of the terrible beast he had seen. They all wondered greatly at the many forms that the great wizard could take upon himself, and the lion said, If he's a beast when I go to see him, I shall roar my loudest and so frighten him that he will grant all I ask, and if he's a lovely lady, I shall pretend to spring upon her and so compel her to do my bidding. And if he's the great head, he will be at my mercy, for I will roll this head all about the room till he promises to give us what we desire. So be of good cheer, my friends, for all will yet be well. The next morning, the soldier with the green whiskers led the lion to the great throne room and bade him enter the presence of Oz. The lion at once passed through the door and glancing around saw to his surprise that before the throne was a ball of fire, so fierce and glowing he could scarcely bear to gaze upon it. His first thought was that Oz had by accident caught on fire and was burning up, but when he tried to go nearer the heat was so intense that it singed his whiskers and he crept back tremblingly to a spot near the door. Then a low, quiet voice came from the ball of fire, and these were the words that it spoke. I am Oz. The great and terrible. Who are you? And why do you seek me? And the lion answered, I am a cowardly lion, afraid of everything. I came to you to beg that you give me courage, so in reality I may become 
the king of beasts, as men call me. Why should I give you courage? demanded Oz. Because of all wizards you are the greatest, and alone have power to grant my request, answered the lion. The ball of fire burned fiercely for a time, and the voice said, Bring me proof that the wicked witch is dead. In that moment I will give you courage, but as long as the witch lives, you must remain a coward. The lion was angry at this speech but could say nothing in reply, and while he stood silently gazing at the ball of fire, it became so furiously hot that he turned tail and rushed from the room. He was glad to find his friends waiting for him, and told them of his terrible interview with the wizard. "'What shall we do now?' asked Dorothy sadly. "'There is only one thing we can do,' returned the lion, "'and that is to go to the land of the Winkies, seek out the Wicked Witch, and destroy her.' "'But suppose we cannot,' said the girl." Then I shall never have courage, declared the lion. And I shall never have brains, added the scarecrow. And I shall never have a heart, spoke the tin woodman. And I shall never see Aunt Em and Uncle Henry, said Dorothy, beginning to cry. Be careful, cried the green girl. The tears will fall on your green silk gown and spot it. So Dorothy dried her eyes and said, I suppose we must try it. But I am sure I do not want to kill anybody, even to see Aunt Em again. I will go with you, for I am too much of a coward to kill the witch, said the lion. I will go too, declared the scarecrow, but I shall not be much help to you. I am such a fool. I haven't the heart to harm even a witch, remarked the tin woodman, but if you go, I shall certainly go with you. Therefore, it was decided to start upon their journey the next morning and the woodman sharpened his axe on a green grindstone, and had all of his joints properly oiled. The scarecrow stuffed himself with fresh straw. Dorothy put new paint on his eyes, that he might see better. The green girl, who was very kind to them, filled Dorothy's basket with good things to eat, and fastened a little bell around Toto's neck with a green ribbon. They went to bed quite early and slept soundly until daylight when they were awakened by the crowing of a green cock that lived in the backyard of the palace, and the cackling of a hen that laid a green egg. Chapter 12 The Search for the Wicked Witch The soldier with the green whiskers led them through the streets of the Emerald City until they reached the room where the guardian of the gates lived. This officer unlocked their spectacles to put them back in his great box, and he politely opened the gate for our friends. "'Which roads lead to the Wicked Witch of the West?' asked Dorothy. "'There is no road,' answered the Guardian of the Gates. "'No one ever wishes to go that way.' "'How then are we to find her?' inquired the girl. "'That will be easy,' replied the man, "'for when she knows you're in the country of the Winkies, "'she will find you, and make you all her slaves.' "'Perhaps not,' said the Scarecrow, "'for we mean to destroy her.' "'Oh!' That is different, said the guardian of the gates. No one has ever destroyed her before, so I naturally thought that she would make slaves of you, as she has of the rest. But take care, for she is wicked and fierce, and may not allow you to destroy her. Keep to the west, where the sun sets, and you cannot fail to find her. They thanked him and bade him goodbye, and turned towards the west, walking over fields of soft grass dotted here and there with daisies and buttercups. Dorothy still wore the pretty silk dress that she had put on in the palace, but now, to her surprise, she found it was no longer green, but pure white. The ribbon around Toto's neck had also lost its green colour, and was as white as Dorothy's dress. The Emerald City was soon left far behind. As they advanced, the ground became rougher and hillier, for there were no farms nor houses in this country of the West and the ground was untilled. In the afternoon, the sun shone hot in their faces, for there were no trees to offer them shade, so that before night Dorothy and Toto and the lion were tired and lay down upon the grasp and fell asleep, with the woodman and the scarecrow keeping watch. Now, the Wicked Witch of the West had but one eye, yet that eye was as powerful as a telescope and could see everywhere. So as she sat in the door of her castle, 
she happened to look around and saw Dorothy lying asleep, with her friends all about her. They were a long distance off, but the Wicked Witch was angry to find them in her country, so she blew upon a silver whistle that hung around her neck. At once came running from all directions a pack of great wolves. They had long legs and fierce eyes and sharp teeth. Go to those people, said the witch, and tear them to pieces. Are you not going to make them your slaves? asked the leader of the wolves. No, she answered. One is tin and one of straw, one is a girl and another a lion. None of them is fit to work, so you may tear them into small pieces. Very well, said the wolf, and he dashed away at full speed, followed by others. It was lucky the scarecrow and the woodman were wide awake and heard the wolves coming. This is my fight, said the woodman. Get behind me, I will meet them as they come. He seized his axe, which he had made very sharp, and as the leader of the wolves came on the tin woodman, he swung his arm and chopped the wolf's head from its body, so that it immediately died. As soon as he could raise his axe, another wolf came up, and he also fell under the sharp edge of the tin woodman's weapon. There were forty wolves, and forty times a wolf was killed, so that at last they all lay dead in a heap before the woodman. He put down his axe and sat beside the scarecrow, who said, It was a good fight, friend. They waited until Dorothy awoke the next morning. The little girl was quite frightened when she saw a great pile of shaggy wolves, but the tin woodman told her all. She thanked him for saving them, and sat down to breakfast, after which they started upon their journey. Now, this same morning the wicked witch came to the door of her castle and looked with her one eye that could see far off. She saw all her wolves lying dead, and the strangers still travelling through her country. This made her angrier than before, and she blew her silver whistle twice. And that is where we shall close the book on tonight's episode of Down to Sleep. A little bit of a cliffhanger, if you will. Until next time. I hope that you enjoyed this episode of Down to Sleep and the continued reading of the wonderful Wizard of Oz 